So now we've got the fundamental theorem of algebra, which is a great algebra result, but it's also a really cool geometry result that says that any polynomial curve of the form y equals a polynomial in x is going to intersect the x-axis. So let's go ahead and go to full screen mode. Okay. So there was this other question of how many intersections we'd have, and we had a conjecture that the number of solutions was equal to the degree of the polynomial. Turns out it's easy to show, just purely algebraic and nothing really particularly deep, that the number of solutions doesn't exceed the degree of the polynomial. So that if, the f if it's a fifth degree, it couldn't have six or seven or eight intersections. But is it really always equal? Well, let's go back to a really simple example. Y equals x squared. This is actually one I showed right at the start of the talk. And so if you were thinking about that and remembering, you would have maybe th thought about, hey, this statement can't be true. There's just one solution. This intersects exactly once. You can even show that algebraically. Any s number that's non-zero, if you square it, it's going to be positive. It's not going to intersect except right at zero. So this was supposed to have two solutions according to our conjecture. It only has one. Well, again, we're going to fudge things a little bit in a way that might seem artificial but leads to wonderfully good stuff. So no, we're actually not going to consider this as one solution. We're going to consider it as two infinitesimally close solutions. So let me show you a little animation of that. Um, here's x squared minus 1, which we've already looked at. Here's x squared minus a half, x squared minus a quarter. If you look at the, what happens to those dots, they get cl closer and closer together. Now, we've already seen that there seems to be no intersection up here. That was x squared plus 1. That's where you had to use complex numbers. But what we see is that it might make sense to think of these dots as right at the instant they coalesce, they actually kind of count double. So it's two solutions, or one multiplicity two solution is how people say it. Okay, so we're going to actually go with that idea. And we're going to think of it as two infinitesimally close solutions. And that idea of infinitesimal, that's really a calculus idea. If you've ever looked at any kind of calculus, the idea of two things that are kind of infinitesimally close together, there's really some calculus hiding there. Okay, so calculus is really coming in sort of in a secret way. Um, and this idea of smooth variation, we're going to see that there's a nice way to express this. So here's a, another way to say it without using this f loaded word infinitesimal to recognize that there is something special about this case that makes it okay to bend the rules here. So with x squared minus 1, that's this blue curve here, that intersected in a very nice way with the x-axis. It really was actually going across it. And one way to make that very precise is at each point of intersection, draw the tangent line. That's a line that, that touches the, the curve right at that point and is going in exactly the same direction. So if you want to find out what's the slope of this line, how steep is it, is it, um, what direction is it going in, you can instead replace it by its tangent line, and then you could get a much simpler analysis. And that idea of taking a tangent line is an absolutely basic one in calculus. And you, that's something that you, to define really carefully, you need calculus concepts. If when we take those tan that tangent line, it is not the same as the x-axis, and so it really is crossing and going in a different direction as it crosses, it's called a transverse intersection. Here, if I take the tangent line to this black curve right at the point of intersection, that is the x-axis. And so it's going, what it's doing is it's just barely touching. And it's going, not only is it touching the x-axis, it's also going in the same direction as the x-axis at the same time. That's a very special behavior. So the, the y equals x squared is tangent to the x-axis as opposed to cr cutting across it in a transverse fashion. So this idea of direction and tangency, which is essentially a calculus concept, tells us that, okay, at least there's something special about this. Does it tell us we really should count it double? It's a little harder to see that, but at least it tells us that, that this maybe deserves to, to have some further analysis rather than just saying, hey, it's just one intersection. Our conjecture was wrong. Um, so what we do is we count any non-transverse intersection, something that doesn't look like this and looks like this, with a multiplicity. It turns out the correct multiplicity here is 2, and I'm going to show you... Um, well, we've already seen one way to, to think about that. If you take this curve and you just drag it down a tiny bit, this one intersection splits into two. And we'll talk about more when I talk about topology in a later part of this talk. We'll, talk, we'll come back to that. But in fact, um, you really can count the multiplicity either with algebra or calculus. With algebra, what you do is you factor the polynomial and you see if a factor is repeated. That might uh, ring a bell. With calculus, um, what you can observe is that the reason it's multiplicity 2 and not even higher, like 3 or 4 or 5, is it turns out when you have the situation, 
where it's touching, that means it has any multiplicity at all, that's in, an intersection, and tangent, that means it's not just multiplicity one, it's not transverse, but it's curving consistently on one side, that turns out to be multiplicity exactly two. I'm not gonna get into any more of the details of that, but it turns out that there's very well-defined ways to use calculus to say this really deserves to be counted as two intersections, no more, no less. Okay, so this really does give us our desired theorem. Um, if you've got y equals p of x, the graph of a polynomial, and you look at how many times it intersects the x-axis, then the number of intersections counted appropriately with multiplicity, certainly a subtle issue, and using complex numbers does equal the degree of the polynomial. Okay, but there's more to go. That's not the pl a place to stop and to say we're done. This was the intersection of two very special curves in the plane. One of them was extremely special, the x-axis, y equals zero, just going boop, setting all, all the y-coordinates to zero and letting x run. The other one was pretty special. It was do anything interesting to x, anything that's a polynomial anyway, no weird functions like sines and cosines or anything like that. That's out of the realm of algebra. Um, but you take any polynomial function of x, but we just let y alone. There's lots of equations you can look at where you do interesting things both to x and to y. So here's an intersection problem. Turns out y squared equals x cubed minus x looks like this blue curve. That appears in the Birch and Swinerton Dyer talk. It's called an elliptic curve. And interestingly enough, it looks nothing like an ellipse, which in fact is what the black curve is. That is an honest-to-god ellipse. That's, it turns out, the equation of that is 4x squared plus 36y squared equals 9. Um, and let's look at what happens. This guy, you look at the highest power that appears, that's a, a 3, so that it has degree 3. This is, defines a, deg a curve of degree 3. This, the highest power that appears is 2, so it defines a curve of degree 2. Notice how many intersections there are. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Hey, that's 3 times 2. That's interesting. Maybe that's the generalization of what we were observing with this special case, and that's what I want to kind of justify. So the conjecture is a cur curve of degree m and a curve of degree n intersect in m times n points counted with multiplicity. Remember, if we go back to this case, if this has degree m, this guy has degree 1 because it's y to the 1 equals 0. Any line, this line is really uh, an algebraic equation. It just has degree 1 because it's just y to the 1 equals 0. So this, our, our theorem here really is a special case of what I'm talking about now. So this is the conjecture. Well, of course, we're going to have to count with multiplicity. And of course, we're going to need to use complex numbers because we are, already knew that. But if this is true, and, we're and there is going to be one more fudge, I'll, I'll be honest. But if it were true, there w it would be another miracle. Introducing the complex numbers made this conjecture work for y equals p of x and y equals 0. You might think that you'd have to introduce even more weird kinds of numbers to make it work for all curves. So I'm not saying there isn't one more thing to do, and we'll go ahead and get into that in just a second, but it's not extending the number system, really. Um, and that's, so that's another miracle, is that what we're going to show, basically, is that what happens for this special case really does work in general. But, big but, there is something else we have to do. Okay. So let's go back to simple cases, as usual. And uh, unfortunately, like we had with the y equals x squared and multiplicity case, um, we're going to discover that we really need, need to do more. But it, it will work out in the end. So we're going to go back to intersecting lines. And again, this is very similar to what I was talking about in my other talk. A line is degree 1. Uh, for example, line could be y equals 1. That's everything at height 1. x equals 3. That's everything with arbitrary height. So y can be anything that x is a certain value. It would go straight up and down. y equals x goes diagonally like this. The height is equal to the horizontal position. And we intersect with another line. So two lines, both degree 1. 1 times 1 is 1. They should intersect in one point. Oh, yeah, of course. Hey, we're done. Great. Do they always intersect in one point? Uh, maybe not. Such a thing as parallel lines. OK. So for example, x equals 2 and x equals 3 are these two little these blue lines. I put it in coordinates. Let's see if maybe complex numbers already save us. They did wonderful things before. Well, if you look at the algebra, if x is 3 and x is 2, well, if those two are both true statements, then 2 has to equal 3. And not even complex numbers will save us there. It's just not going to work. There's another thing that has to, be, has to come up. Okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to try and sneak up on things here. I'm going to do a little primitive animation here. So instead of having them be parallel, I went ahead and I took this guy and I rotated it around the point 3, 0 so that it would intersect. 
And now I'm going to rotate it back towards being more and more close to parallel. Notice what happens to the point of intersection. It goes off to infinity as the lines become parallel. Really, this is sort of calculus notions coming in again. What we're doing is we're trying to sneak up on the, 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 the fact that the parallel lines didn't have an intersection by looking at a bunch of related cases and looking at the limit, the trend of what happens to a bunch of related cases. And anything that has to do with infinity, really, uh, calculus is definitely coming in there. So here's what we need. When you have parallel lines, what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to extend the geometry. It's not so much the same kind of thing as extending the number system like we do with complex numbers. We're really extending the space that we have, the geometric space. Um, it does have an algebraic co counterpart, but it's more kind of a geometric operation. So we need a point at infinity. What we're going to do is we're going to say that parallel lines do intersect. It seems like a really counterintuitive thing to say, but it's a wonderful thing to say at a cocktail party. Yes, parallel lines do intersect. They intersect at the point at infinity. Because if you rotated this ever so slightly, it would intersect just really far away. And if you intersect it, and if you rotate it even less, uh, even more slightly, it'll intersect further away. So we declare there to be a point at infinity that they intersect at. Well, how many? I claim there actually has to be more than one point at infinity. Here's why. These two parallel lines and these two parallel lines, let's consider these. These guys, I want there to be a point at infinity that they intersect at. These guys, I want there to be a point at infinity that they intersect at. What if, economically speaking, I'd like it to be the same point? But let's look, for example, at this line and this line. They clearly intersect right about here. Okay. And I don't want two lines to intersect more than once. I want there to be one point of intersection. It's really important to make this theorem work. If they both were, had the same point at infinity on them, they would intersect at that one point at infinity. So it turns out we need a point at infinity for this parallel, parallel lines where they intersect and one for this parallel line, this pair, and one in every direction. Now it's actually just one for this guy. You might think there's a point at infinity way up top left and one bottom right. Turns out those should be the same point. And so that's kind of weird. You can get to it by going way, way, way far this way, but then you can teleport and it's the same as what you would get if you went way, way far this way. I'll have a picture of that in a minute. Okay. Oh, right here. Okay. So the, it's called the projective plane, and I'll talk a little bit about what it's called projective uh, soon. It's the ordinary plane plus a set of what are called points at infinity. And it has wonderful properties. Any two points determine a line, because you just take two points and you take the line that's on those points, the, through those points. And any two lines intersect in a point. Notice the duality between these. Two points determine a line, two lines determine a point, and no exceptions. There used to be an exception for parallel lines. This was not true. Now the exceptions have gone away, and mathematicians love that to make sure, sure there's no exceptions to theorems. Okay. Um, now, the parallel lines do intersect in a special point, namely the point at infinity. Okay. So here's a way to picture that. Here's the ordinary plane, and then here, is the points, here are the points at infinity. And uh, this is one of Dan Freed's pictures, and I must admit, I, I'm not satisfied with it. I should have maybe fixed it. Um, these two green points, pretend that's just one point, please. And these two green points, pretend that's just one point. Because these two green lines are supposed to be intersecting at a single point at infinity, which is this guy. Or maybe just imagine that these guys aren't there. Maybe he said something different from what I'm imagining when he did his talk. I just looked at his slides. So here's a point at infinity that corresponds to where these intersect. And it's really the same point as the guy over here. Similarly, uh, this line goes through this pink point at infinity, which is really the same thing as this. So here's an interesting thing. This, the set of points at infinity in this picture looks like a circle. And in fact, what it really is is it looks like a circle that's kind of glued to itself in a weird way. So that this guy is really the same as this. You want to picture it as having glued this point to this and this point to this, etc. Um, it turns out that when you analyze it in the right way, it really acts just like a line. In fact, what we've done is we've taken the plane and added one single line at infinity, which is pretty funky. So this is kind of hard to get your mind around. A, the idea of points at infinity, and B, the fact that it looks like a circle, and in some ways it behaves like a circle, but geometrically it behaves like a line. Pretty funky. One more example of, of this. I, I don't want to let it go with too few examples. Um, of this, and this is really very similar to what I did in my other talk. How about a line of degree 1? Let's say y equals x. That's this line, the blue line. And another degree 2 equation, which I'm, we'll talk about briefly again in a minute, or a few minutes, is a hyperbola. x squared minus y squared equals 1 
I want you to believe that that's this black curve. It's very cool. Okay. Do these intersect in two points? Well, it kind of doesn't look like it. It kind of looks like it's not wanting to intersect. Let's check the algebra. If I say y and x are supposed to be the same quantity, but the difference of x squared minus y squared is supposed to be 1, what? x and y are the same. That means I can just replace the y here with x. But x squared minus x squared is clearly 0. And that's not equal to 1. And no, no complex number magic is going to make that work, once again. Okay. What's, but what's really going on is the point at infinity stuff. Okay. So what's going on is let's just take this sort of calculus idea of sneaking up on stuff and um, tilt the line down substantially. That will intersect in two points. Now let's kind of rotate it back into place. Here's one that's closer to y equals x. It's intersecting in two points, but further out. And you can picture that if I keep rotating that line back into the y equals x form, those lines are going to move off to infinity. In fact, I do have the animation set up right here. Oh, actually, this one is one I showed, should have shown before. Here's two lines intersecting, and you can see the point of, of intersection that zooms off to infinity. Should have showed that already. OK, but you could probably picture that before. Here, it's a little harder to picture this guy. Here's the line intersecting a hyperbola. And if it's at a not 45 degree angle, it intersects at two points. As the angle approaches 45 degrees towards y equals x, boom, point zooms off to infinity. OK. So that's another case where we're going to have to use this idea of point, points at infinity. So what we say is that y equals x actually does intersect. And it turns out it's a multiplicity 2 intersection when you analyze it. There's really just one sort of geometric point of intersection, the point at infinity associated to this line. But it's actually tangent to the hyperbola at the point at infinity. So that's a, just a good thing to say, again, at a cocktail party. I've thought about something that's tangent to a hyperbola at the point at infinity. That's pretty neat. Okay. So here's a good put, stopping place for this part of the talk. This is what we've been sneaking up on. The conjecture we had is called Bazou's theorem. It's a, it's a real theorem goes back to the 18th century, Etienne Bezu. Um, a curve of degree m and a curve of degree n intersect in mn points if we use complex numbers, we count intersections with multiplicity, and we add points at infinity to, um, to make it the projective plane and not just the ordinary plane. So we really need the complex projective plane. And so here's another miracle, though. Again, we've done some radical stuff. We added artificial points at infinity. What was our motivation for that? It was just to make this work in the simplest case where they're just two straight lines. And as soon as I add just enough points to make the lines work, I don't have to do anything more complicated to make it true for all curves. So I made it work basically for straight lines and for x squared plus 1 equals 0 and for curves intersecting the x-axis, three sort of special cases. And if I do enough to make those three special cases work, this incredibly general theorem works out. And I think that is really a, a very cool miracle to think about.